Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to the first letter of John. So first John, not John, the gospel account of Jesus' life, but first John. If you turn to the end of your Bible, get your revelation, take a left, and just a couple of books back, you'll come to first John. As you're turning, I want to welcome all of our different congregations uh, together in Montgomery County, Loudoun, on Main Avenue, and out at Prince William especially. So Prince William is celebrating their ninth anniversary together today. So we praise God for nine years of that congregation. I really kind of wish I was there because they're having like massive potluck today. And uh, so we praise God for his grace. And you brothers and sisters, it's good to be together back together across Washington around God's word. It's been good for me over, over previous weeks to be at uh, different campuses and uh, been good for various pastors to preach at various campuses. And now it's good to come back together as we begin today a journey through the book of First John. So Lord willing, over the next 10 weeks, we're gonna journey together through this Bible book. And Today I want to show you why this Bible book. I want to show you why as pastors, when we got together from different congregations and we prayed and we discussed, this book came to the forefront. I want to show you why a journey through the book of 1 John is critical for your life. And I don't want this to be a passive journey, so I want to give you a challenge today from the start of this journey. I want to challenge every follower of Christ to memorize a chapter in this book of the Bible, specifically 1 John chapter 1. Now, that may sound daunting to you, like, oh, maybe you meant a verse, but <laughs> it's not what I meant. I meant a uh, chapter. And here's the deal. There are, there are 10 verses in 1 John 1. We have 10 weeks we're going to be walking through this Bible book. So that's how many verses per week? One. Like one verse per week. And if you average out, like I haven't counted how many words are in the verses, but it's like a word or two a day. Like you can do this. You can do this. Every follower of Christ, and obviously if you're not yet a follower of Christ, if you're exploring Christianity, maybe this is even your first time in church today, you are welcome to take the challenge too. But particularly for followers of Christ, I'm guessing there's many who have never memorized an, an entire chapter of the Bible. And this is your chance. I, I can't overstate the effect of memorizing scripture on your life and your walk with God. Scripture memorization will transform your life, your family, your work, everything about you. God, God doesn't even really tell us to read his word. He tells us to meditate on it day and night. And that's in a sense what memorization helps us to do. When you memorize something, you internalize it. You say it to yourself over and over and over again until it becomes a part of you, until you can just kind of rattle it off, right? Like we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, like just kind of rolls out. When you memorize something, it just flows from your mind out of your mouth like it's second nature. Don't we want God's word to be like that for us? It just flows from us. Now, I don't presume that means it's easy. I'll go ahead and let you know. First John 1 is not going to be an easy chapter to memorize. These first few verses that we're going to look at today even are grammatically complex. So old John hasn't helped us out a lot here. We'll cut him some slack though. He wasn't writing this in English. So I don't want to just challenge you. I want to help you. So over the course of the next 10 weeks, every week, I'll lead us through some kind of review. And week by week, we'll just take things one verse at a time. Feel free to jump ahead, but we're going to go one verse at a time together. And I trust that God will show the power of his word, not just in your life, but in our life together as a church as we do this. So what I want to do is I want to... My, my plan was just to, to, at this point, read 1 John chapter 1, um, and then we're going to camp out on the first few verses today. But I heard about a group in Montgomery County uh, of brothers 
in Christ who were set out earlier this summer. They wanted to start memorizing some scripture together and they just so happened to start in 1 John. So uh, I want you, instead of me reading through the first chapter, I want you to hear it from them. So watch this video with me. Hi guys, my name is Philippe Prosper and I'm a longtime MEC congregant and I work full time as a local missionary doing evangelism and discipleship to men in the marketplace. And man, my deepest desire and longing is to see people fall fully in love with Christ and to live this all in supernatural call uh, in our walks with Christ that God's called us to live. And one of the things I love and long to see is seeing biblical knowledge go from people's minds to really being imprinted on their hearts. And so in this season of discipling men, as I started praying, God, what can I do to maximize uh, things going from people's minds to their hearts? I know your Holy Spirit does a transformation, but what can I do? Of course, God's word um, came to mind in Jeremiah 15, 16 came to mind, which says, your words were found, I ate them. I ingested them and they became a delight to me and the joy of my heart. And so I started seeking out men in Moco, a group that I could lead of men that would commit to memorizing entire books of God's word together, trusting that God will use his living and active word to transform our lives radically and to level, help us live even more courageous, bold, unhindered, supernatural walks with him. And so we sought out without knowing that NBC was going to do uh, First John chapter one. Um, we sought out to memorize First John chapter one uh, to five. And it's been an amazing experience. I want you guys to check this out um, every Sunday we send each other um, what we've memorized on top of meeting together and mind you these guys have full-time jobs we're all married uh, we all have young kids one just had a baby and God's given us the grace to prioritize hiding his word in our hearts trusting him to transform us and so check this out I pray this encourages you guys as we seek out to do this as a church body and um, yeah God bless you That was just from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and in touch with our hands concerning the word of life. Car la vie a été manifestée, nous l'avons vu, nous lui rendons témoignage, et nous avons lancé la vie éternelle qui était auprès du Père, qui nous a été manifestée. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us in our fellowship. We are fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. La nouvelle que nous avons apprise de lui et que nous annonçons, c'est que Dieu est lumière et qu'en lui n'y a point de ténèbres. If anybody claims to know him, he walks in the darkness, he's a liar. He does not live by the truth. If we, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we are liars, and the word of God is not in us. All right, now just for clarification, we're not necessarily all doing chapters one through five, like they are, and we're doing this in English uh, <laughs> together. Feel free to do it in French as well, or any of the other multiplicity of languages that are spoken across McLean Bible Church. So go for it. Just, I just want to lower expectations for what's going to happen right here. Uh, it's, it's going to be English, one chapter, as we walk through that this this 10 weeks. So, all right, here's what I wanna do. If, if you're taking notes today, I wanna I want share with you two sets of two. So, so first, I wanna share with you two prayers that I am praying for you over the next 10 weeks as we walk through this book. So two things I'm praying God will do in your life. And these two prayers are based on the book as a whole. And then I want us to hone in on the first four verses here in 1 John 1. And I want to show you two truths that hold the key to seeing these two prayers answered in your life. So two prayers and two truths. We'll start with the two prayers. Two hopes, two desires that I have as your pastor. And by the way, that's the perspective from which John is writing this book. This is the Apostle John, one of Jesus' disciples who spent three years with Jesus, wrote the gospel of John, that account of Jesus' life. And then he became a pastor in Ephesus. 
and wrote this letter to the churches around Ephesus, Asia Minor, think modern day Turkey, near the end of his life. And in this letter, along with the two letters that come after it, so 2 John, 3 John, he's expressing his heart as a pastor for these churches. That's one of the reasons why I and other pastors here at McLean want to study this book with you because it expresses in many ways my heart, our heart for this church, specifically for the brothers and sisters in this church across different congregations. So here's the first prayer, hope, desire that I have for you as we study this book. Number one, I want you to know that you have eternal life. I want you to know. And I would say this to every person within the sound of my voice right now. I want you to know I pray that you will know that you have eternal life. So that's that's the purpose of the book of 1 John. He says it. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 13. John says this outright. Like this is verbatim what he says. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. He's coming to the end of the book. And he says in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's, that's why I'm writing this. And you know what's interesting? I'll put this up here on the screen. We don't have time to turn to it. But near the end of the Gospel of John, so Jesus, John's account of Jesus' life there, John tells us why he wrote that book. And listen to what he says there. John 20, 31. These are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That sound familiar? This is a theme for John. Here in 1 John, this letter, John uses this, this word life, this phrase eternal life over and over again. Ten different times he uses that word, that phrase eternal life, an average of twice a chapter. And he uses the words knowing and perceiving almost 50 times. John wanted men and women in the churches around him to know they had eternal life. And I want you to know that. Like this week, I've tried to think of something that I would want you to know more than that, and I can't come up with it. I, I can come up with different ways of saying this, but it's basically the same thing. I want you to know that you have eternal life. Don't you want to know that? And th this is so huge because, follow this, you can be deceived about eternal life. That's part of why John's writing this letter. Because some of the people he's writing to were deceived and they were deceiving others about eternal life. People were saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they weren't believing in Christ truly. People were saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but then they weren't obeying or following Christ. People were saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but there was no evidence of the love of Christ in their lives. And John says in this book, they're not Christians. They're deceived. And that kind of deception is a reality in the church today. There are all kinds of people who think, say they're Christians, but they're not. Let me say that again. There are all kinds of people, many people in the church who think, who say they're Christians, but they're not. Many people who think, say they have eternal life, but they don't. They're deceived. And I don't want you to be deceived. The last thing I want is for you to be deceived. The last thing I want is for anybody to sit in this church today and week after week after week thinking you're a Christian when you're not. Thinking you have eternal life when you don't. I want you to know that you have eternal life. And I say this because on one hand, you can be deceived about eternal life. But on the other hand, you can be sure about eternal life. That's the point here in 1 John 5, 13. He's saying you can be sure. And so over the coming weeks, I want to show you how you can be sure. Uh, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that this week I was, I was in some storage getting something out of a, a box. And I came across uh, some... <laughs> 
some stuff from when I was in high school, a variety of interesting things, including what's in this bag. And I hesitate to pull it out because I think it's kind of gross. Um, let me give you a little setup and, and leave your anticipation just kind of waiting to see what gross thing is in this bag. Uh, so uh, when I was in high school, I played baseball and uh, I uh, hurt myself one year, uh, broke my wrist in the middle of a baseball game. And so had to, season ruined, uh, had to, it was out the rest of the season, had a cast. So I'd broken my wrist, but the cast went all the way up here on my arm. And I was just really bummed, but I kept the cast. So don't you think that's kind of gross? Like, I don't think anybody else in here wants to touch this thing, right? I don't, I don't really want to touch it. Like, what? So anyway, but I kept the cast. Well, here's why I kept the cast. Because uh, it was a reminder of God's grace during that time. So, I, uh, so I've got here, let me go pull out this little arm thing here. Uh, isn't that kind of gross? Like, I mean, so anyway, but here's why I want to show it to you. Because uh, I was really bummed about missing the season and like, God, why? And as I was praying about that, he said, well, why don't, why don't you use this for good? And uh, so I, I wanted to see friends and others in school like come to know Christ. And so I got an idea and I had my older brother write on the side of the cast. And here's what he wrote. R, I don't know if you can zoom in on that camera wise, but it says, are you sure? And it has John 3.16 right there. So are you sure? So, so here I am stuck like this for like however many weeks. And so I'm walking down the hall or sitting in class and people look over or stop me like what? Or just anywhere else, not just at school. But it's so like stop me like what, 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 is, what does that mean? And I would say, well, are you sure that you have eternal life, that you'll go to heaven when you die? And people are like, uh, I don't know. Like, well, let's talk about that. I'm glad you brought this up. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so like, I could just like share the gospel just like by walking and, uh, and, and it would just introduce all kinds of conversations. So anyway, so I, I, I came across this and I knew what I was studying. I'm like, that's what I want to do in this series. I just want to hold it up. I, in all seriousness, like, I want to ask this question of every single person. Like, are you sure? You, do you know that you have eternal life? Like, it's a really important question. I can't think of many more important questions, maybe any more important question than that. So I want you to know that you have eternal life because you can be sure. Let me put this gross thing up. <laughs> I want you to know not to have any question about having eternal life. Then my second prayer so my second hope and desire, I want you to experience God's everlasting love. I want you to experience God's everlasting love. So life, eternal life, no. Like those are common themes in 1 John. But we also see the word love almost 50 times in 100 or so verses, which means that on average, almost every other verse in John talks about love. Highlighted in John 1 John 4, 8. But this, we know God is love. And I want you to experience God like that as love. Not, not just to know that or hear that. Like God, God loves you. Maybe one of the first phrases we hear in the church, most common phrases we use in the church. But what does it mean? Not just to hear that, like know that in your head, but to experience that in your heart. Feel that in your life, because there's a big difference there. It's, it's like hearing about, maybe even seeing pictures of the Grand Canyon and all of its majesty. But then you go there and you're standing there on the precipice of it and it stretches as far as your eyes can see and you're just in awe, overwhelmed, like speechless. Like none of the pictures I saw did this justice. This is awesome. And that's what I want to do in First John. I want to take you, I want to take you to the Grand Canyon of God's love in a way that you, do. you don't just hear that, you feel that, you don't just know that, you're overwhelmed by the love of God. You're speechless in awe of it. That's, that's what I, I want you to experience God's everlasting love like that. I want you to see in this letter that you, right where you're sitting 
right now, wherever you are in Ross, Cross Washington, you have been created to enjoy God's love for you. Not just to know his love, but to enjoy his love. Think about someone you enjoy, what you enjoy doing with them. I think about my wife, my kids. I just started a new season uh, coaching them in sports yesterday. And, uh, I love my kids, but I have no clue what I'm doing in flag football. <laughs> we got demolished and, it, and I had no idea what to do. Like throw the ball better, run faster. I don't know, guys, just have fun. And, but I, I'm looking at them and I just, I love watching them play. I love watching my little two boys playing football and my daughter play soccer and coaching my five-year-old in t-ball. Like I love, I enjoy life with them. And this is, this is what I long for you and your relationship with God, that you would enjoy life with him. And you would have this kind of relationship with him, not just a matter of mere religious exercise and duty and monotonous motion, but that you would enjoy a love relationship with God. I fear far too many professing Christians just are not just walking in enjoyment of the love of God. And I'm zealous for you to experience that. And not just you. First John will also make clear that you and I have been created to express God's love for others. That God's love for us is intended to be a, a fountain flowing from us to others in our homes, in our marriages, to our kids, in our workplaces. I just love. I reading 1 Corinthians 13 this morning, just praying, God, make this kind of love just flow from my heart to people I work with, to people I interact with. And this city, and the world around us, specifically those in urgent spiritual and physical need, our lives, our families, our church is created to be an expression of God's love for others. So these are my prayers twofold over the next 10 or so weeks as we walk through the book of 1 John. One, that you would know that you have eternal life. And Two, that you would experience, experience and enjoy God's everlasting love. So with that stage set, I want to show you two truths in the first four verses of First John. So these are verses that we're going to memorize together eventually. Um, and like I mentioned, they're grammatically complex, which is going to make them harder to memorize. There are easier parts of the Bible to memorize than First John 1. But part of the reason they're hard is because the language John uses here is just intense. It's like he's repeating himself in different ways. It's just flowing out of him in passion. So read it that way. And John's saying, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes. Like imagine somebody, when they see something amazing, they come back and like, you would never guess what I saw. We've seen with our eyes which we've looked upon, we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. We've seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father was made manifest to us. That which we have seen. You hear he's repeating himself. We saw, we saw it, we heard it, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father. And with his son, Jesus Christ. And we were writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Oh, what does that mean? Two truths. Two truths I want you to see here. First truth. John's saying, and the Bible is teaching here. Number one, Jesus is eternal life. Jesus is Eternal life. This is the key. If you want to know that you have eternal life, you have to know Jesus. Not just know about him. You have to know him. Now what's interesting about these verses is on one hand, it doesn't seem like Jesus is talking about a person. He doesn't start by saying, he who was from the beginning, but that which was from the beginning. That which we have heard, not he whom we have heard. So it's almost like 
John is talking about something, not someone, that. Like he's talking about a concept, eternal life, the word of life, not a person. But that's where it gets interesting because he keeps going and he says, we've seen it with our eyes and we physically touched it with our hands. So how in the world do you see a concept with your eyes? How do you physically touch a concept with your hands? That's something you do with an object that's more personal. And when you get down to the end of verse two, he says, we proclaim to you the eternal life. So it sounds like a concept, eternal life. But then he says, that which was with the father, which is clearly a reference to a person. And that's the point of these verses. Follow this. The concept of eternal life cannot be separated from the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is eternal life. Without Jesus, you don't have eternal life. Which is exactly what the Gospel of John teaches us about Jesus. If you remember back, John chapter 1, verse 4, when John's introducing that gospel, that Bible book, John says about Jesus, in him was life. John 14, 6, what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, 3, Jesus prayed, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you, God, and they may know Jesus, you want to know you have eternal life, you must have Jesus. Now that is a bold claim. To seven billion plus people in the world and countless more throughout history before now, to say that Jesus is the only hope for anyone's and everyone's eternal life. How is that possible? I mean, in, the, in a world of religions, and ideas and thoughts. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. He alone is eternal life. How is that possible? Well, John tells us this is true because Jesus is the revelation of God. That's the language in verse two. At the beginning and end of this verse, it says the life was made manifest. It was revealed. God, who's the author of all life, from the beginning, notice how 1 John 1.1 1, 1 echoes Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God so Jesus is the revelation of the God who was in the beginning. The Bible's saying here, see who Jesus is. He's the one who was with the Father from the beginning before anything else ever was. Which is key because there were supposed Christians in Asia Minor around Ephesus in the first century who were denying that Jesus is God. And John is warning the church not to believe that heresy, that false teaching. And that wasn't just... In the first century, that continued in subsequent centuries. There was a leader in the church named Arius in the third century. He was a very prominent proponent of this position, trying to persuade people in the church that Jesus was created by God the Father. Therefore, Jesus was not equal with God. And he was persuasive. Many people were believing him. That God raised up a man named Athanasius, 40 years the junior of Arius, to refute that teaching. Athanasius was threatened multiple times. He stared down murderous intruders who would storm into the church where he was pastoring. He stood before emperors who had the power to cut off his head. Those emperors ended up sending him into exile five different times. You know how you get sent to exile five different times? You keep coming back. <laughs> you keep fighting for truth. Because he knew this truth was the key to eternal life. Jesus is the revelation of God. He is God in human flesh. See who Jesus is and see what Jesus has done. He has come to us. God, that's the point here in 1 John 1, has come to us. We've seen him, we've heard him, we've touched him with our hands. This is the breathtaking reality of the Bible. Feel this. I remember sitting across the table from a struggling teenager at camp, walking through all kinds of challenges in her life and family. She didn't believe in God. And when I asked her, what would it take for you to believe in him? She said, if God would just come down and show himself to me, then I would believe. And this is exactly what God has done. I said, I have good news for you. God has come to us. The life, the eternal life, the author of life before the world ever even began. He has come. His name is Jesus. And this changes everything. Amen. This changes everything. Because 
the implications of this truth have ramifications for every single life in this room and other campuses right now. And not just for your life now. Ramifications for your life forever. And not just for your life in general, but for every single detail of your life. Every single decision in your life. Please listen closely to what I'm about to say. There were many people in the first century, even professing Christians, who had a small, distorted, deceived view of Jesus. And as a result, they had a small, distorted, deceived view of what it meant to follow him. And today, in the 21st century, there are many people, even professing Christians, who have a small, distorted, deceived view of Jesus. And as a result, they have a small, distorted, deceived view of what it means to follow him. There are many people in the world today who are content to see Jesus as a good religious teacher who did good things but they're not about to follow him as God, as the only Lord over their lives and their family and their money and their future. My fear is that there are many people in the church who are exactly the same, who are content to come to the church and keep Jesus at arm's distance, glad to give him a tip of our hats, but unwilling to follow him as God, as Lord over every detail of our lives, and our family, and our money, and our future. John Piper was writing about the incarnation, so the doctrine, the teaching, the truth, that Jesus is God in the flesh. And he said, well, it's kind of a long quote, but follow it with me. He said, many are willing to believe in Christ if he remains a merely spiritual reality. But when we preach that Christ has become a particular man in a particular place, issuing particular commands and dying on a particular cross, exposing the particular sins of our particular lives, then that preaching ceases to be acceptable for many. I don't think it's so much the mystery of a divine and human nature in one person that causes most people to stumble over the doctrine of the incarnation. The stumbling block is that if this doctrine is true, Every single person in the world must obey this one particular Jewish man. Everything he says is law. Everything he did is perfect. And the particularity of his work and word flow out into history in the form of a particular inspired book that claims a universal authority over every other book that has ever been written. This he said it's the stumbling block of the incarnation. When God becomes a man, he strips away every pretense of man to be God. We can no longer do our own thing. We must do what this one Jewish man wants us to do. We can no longer pose as self-sufficient because this one Jewish man says we are all sick with sin and must come to him for healing. We can no longer depend on our wisdom to find life because this one Jewish man who lived for 30 obscure years in a little country in the Middle East says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When God becomes a man, man ceases to be the measure of all things and this man becomes the measure of all things. This is simply intolerable to the rebellious heart of men and women. The incarnation is a violation of the bill of human rights written by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's totalitarian, it's authoritarian, imperialism, despotism, usurpation, absolutism. Who does he think he is? He is God. Amen. Jesus is the Lord over all the universe and he's Lord over you. 
and eternal life hinges for you on bowing the knee to his lordship in your life. Jesus is eternal life. You want eternal life? You must make Jesus your life. Not part of your life. Not your Sundays. But your life. That's the first truth. Here's the second one. Flowing from that. Jesus offers everlasting love. Jesus offers everlasting love. So these, these go with the prayers, remember? So I pray that you'll know you have eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. I pray that you will enjoy God's everlasting love. Jesus is the one who gives it, offers it. So I mentioned the word love is all over 1 John, but you'll notice it's not found in the verses we just read. In fact, it's not anywhere in chapter 1. You don't see love mentioned at all. But that doesn't mean the love of God is not here. It's all over here. It's all over what we just talked about. Think about it. How do you know someone loves you? They show it, right? They reveal, manifest, make known their love to you by their actions. Someone might say all the time that they love you, but if their actions show the exact opposite, then you might begin to wonder if it's true. Love, in this sense, in order to be love, must be made known. And that is is the word that's used over and over again in this passage. Made known. This eternal life was made manifest. We've seen it. We've heard it. We've touched it. Listen to verse 3. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us and follow this. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? That word fellowship, it's repeated Four times here in chapter 1, twice in what we just read, then once in verse 6, once in verse 7. We've talked about this word before, koinonia. It's a Greek word that means like a, a close bond, and an intimate relationship. Like it's used to describe the marriage relationship. And John just said, I, we have a bond, an intimacy relationship with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, like that. Talk about love. Jesus has made the way for everlasting fellowship with God for you and me. What? Like we're sinners. All of us in this room. We all deserve separation from God forever. Everlasting judgment. That's what we warrant Total separation from God and his love forever. But the beauty of this passage is that God has not left us alone over here, separated from him. He has come to us in Jesus. We've seen him. We've heard him. We've touched him. All the way to the point where we crucified him. That's how we touched him. We as rebellious sinners against God, we took God in the flesh and nailed him to a cross in the most cruel form of death we could conceive in our minds. Yet Jesus endured that cross. Do you know why? Because he loves us. Because he loves you. First John 3.16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. Jesus willingly, lovingly died for sin he did not commit, endured the judgment of sin, death that we deserve. So that, so follow this, so that when we repent, when we turn from our sin and our rebellion against God and his lordship, and we believe, we put our faith in Jesus as our Lord and our life, then get this, the way is now made for us to have fellowship with God, intimacy with God, like a marriage relationship, kind of closeness with God. Oh, Heather and I and the kids spent some days away recently, and uh, Heather and I would wake up in the morning before the kids got up, and separately we'd just go outside and watch the sunrise and spend time with God. And that first morning, I, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the sun as it rises over the horizon, 
its beams start to radiate in all kinds of ways across the vastness of creation. And it just, it just hit me in a fresh way. Like, I know this God. I know him. Like I'm talking to him right now. Nice move. <laughs> that was awesome. Do it again tomorrow. <laughs> I, I was talk, he's talking to me. Is that, is that an amazing thought? I just sit there and realize I have communion with this guy, fellowship with this guy just fell on my face. I was just so overwhelmed. I have fellowship with God. And so the good news I have is you can have it too. Every one of you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can have fellowship with God. And I'm just zealous for you not to miss this. And the busyness of this life and all the details of your day and the pressures around you and the challenges you're walking through, I just want you to know Jesus has made the way for you to experience intimacy and joy and fellowship and union with God. Don't miss that. I don't, don't walk through life missing that. And by all means, please don't walk through life missing that and then call it Christianity. That's not Christianity. So for those of you who are here, you're not Christians, please hear this. You're exploring Christianity. Please hear the good news. Jesus offers you everlasting love. He has come. He's died on a cross to cover over your sin. He's made a way for you to have fellowship with God. And you can have that, that kind of fellowship with God today. Now, there's no list of things you got to go do. Now, you turn and say, I, I want, forgive me my sin. I want to be reconciled to you. He answers that prayer. So put your trust in him. You're reconciled to God. And I say that so even those of you who, yeah, might call yourselves Christians, but if you're honest, you don't know this kind of fellowship with God. You don't know intimacy with God, like closeness to God. I just want to plead with you this morning, over the next 10 weeks as we walk through this book, not to settle for anything less than this. I begin, as so I was praying with some out in the lobby, it's just people come and say, I want that kind of intimacy with God. So yes, just begin crying out today for that kind of intimacy with God. God wants to answer that prayer. He wants you to know and enjoy his everlasting love. This is not something he's trying to hide from you. He's ready to pour it out on you if you'll ask for it. Amen. And not just those with God for us, but it gets even better. Jesus has also made the way for everlasting fellowship with the others. So that's where the whole deal starts here in verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we also proclaim to you that you too may have fellowship with us. And he's talking about fellowship in the church. Not with those who were doing these false teachings and undercutting the gospel. Don't fellowship with them. That's not true fellowship. True fellowship happens in Christ. Because when we're reconciled to God, then we, the way is paid for us to be reconciled in relationship with one another. But those who believe Jesus is God and the Lord of life, think about it. You have everlasting fellowship with God. I have everlasting fellowship with God. You have everlasting fellowship with God. That means we have everlasting fellowship with one another before God. We experience a fellowship in the church that is designed to be totally different from any, every other type of fellowship in the world. One of the things we're going to talk about in the coming months uh, is being more intentional as a church about adoption and foster care. Uh, Heather and I and the kids and I were uh, uh, with uh, one of the ministries, the adoption ministries we are partnering with, Lifelines Unadopted. We were running a 5K yesterday. I say running a 5K. I was lugging a five-year-old on my back through this 5K yesterday. Had a lot of time to think. And uh, I was thinking about what, what an amazing reality it is to be adopted into the family of God. Something we're going to see all over 1 John. He calls the Christians who first read this letter, he calls them children. Children of God, because that's what they are. I was just thinking, I, I'm, a, I'm a son. You're a son, a daughter of God. That means I'm your brother. 
I said that in the first gathering. I said that. And somebody immediately said, yikes. <laughs> so I get it. That's how families work. I, I just looked back at him and said, I'm going to be your brother forever. <laughs> so we're, we're brothers and sisters. Like There is designed by God for us and tended to be a, a family kind of relationship that, that will last forever. Huh. It'll be a lot better when there's no more sin between us. <laughs> a lot better. But you put all this together, then you realize why John says what he says in verse 4. Because Jesus has made the way, not just for fellowship, everlasting fellowship with God, with others. He's made the way for everlasting joy. Verse 4, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I love that. John says, oh, this is so good to be in fellowship with God, but my joy is not complete until, follow this, my joy is made more complete by writing these things to you so that you experience eternal life and everlasting love in Jesus. Isn't that true? When, when you have an opportunity to share Jesus, eternal life in Jesus with somebody else, and they put their faith in Jesus, and they receive eternal life, and have their eyes open to everlasting love, you know what that does in you? Joy. Like, amazing joy. I was talking with somebody earlier this morning. A uh, member here, I won't mention his name, because I didn't ask him for permission, but uh, uh, he just said, I, I was in a conversation with a coworker recently. They just got a, a really uh, bad diagnosis. They're on a hospital bed. And he said, I just, I just went for it. And I said, listen, we don't have time to, to kind of talk around this. The only way to eternal life is Jesus. Goes to the gospel. And his coworker, they're in the hospital bed, says, I want to trust in Jesus. I want eternal life. And, and he said, David, I'm, I'm guessing you've experienced this before. I've never experienced this. That was awesome. I, I talk about joy, seeing somebody else come to life forever. <laughs> Don't you want that kind of, you think right now, think about people. So think about not just people generally. Think about someone in your sphere of influence this week. Someone, like picture him, who doesn't know eternal life and everlasting love in Jesus right now. Someone in your family friend you'll see this week, a co-worker, somebody at school, somebody you'll, you'll see this week in your sphere of influence who doesn't know eternal life and love in Jesus. Like, would you just walk away from this word today praying for them? God, open their eyes and see your life and love that's found in Jesus. And then praying for boldness for you to share that life with them. Just, just, just know uh, if, by God's grace, that person comes to know eternal life, love in Jesus, you will experience glorious joy. That's what we want, isn't it? What we want in our families, isn't that what we want in our friendships, isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want across the city? Don't we want more and more and more people to know eternal life and everlasting love in Jesus? God. Please bless the church for the spread of that life and love in Washington, D.C. And beyond, we want this life and love to be known among all the peoples of the earth. Oh, put it all together. I pray. I pray that you will know you have eternal life. That you will experience God's everlasting love in your life. All of these things found in Jesus. And then the life and love of Jesus will just flow through you and me and us together in a way that spreads for the joy of more and more and more people. Amen. Across Washington, D.C. and around the world for his glory. May it be so. May it be so. In fact, let's, let's pray for that now. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you... Bow your heads with me. And I, you, you've got, a, you've got a, a name or a face in your mind. Let's just pray very practically. Just picture them. And would you just pray right now for that person, that they would come to know eternal life in Jesus.
You pray that God would open their eyes. God would do what only he can do. He would supernaturally open their eyes. Just ask God to save them from their sin. and Bring them to himself. And would, you, would you pray right now for yourself that you would have boldness, courage, compassion to share Jesus with them this week? Just pray for an opportunity. Pray for courage to step through that door. Take that opportunity. Pray that God would help you to do that. And even as we pray for others in our sphere of influence, I know that God's brought people here today who don't know eternal life and love in Jesus. If that's you, I just want to invite you right now. You can cry out to God in your heart just to pray, God, I, I, I need you to forgive me of my sin, my s- separation from you. Lord, bring me into fellowship with you. Jesus, you have died on the cross for my sin. I trust in you as Lord of my life. You pray that you can be reconciled to God right now. And for all of us to, to pray together, Jesus, we want to know and enjoy and experience the depth of eternal life and everlasting love in you. Lord, we don't want a half-hearted experience of life and love. We want the whole thing. So Jesus, we're coming to you right now based on your word. And we're saying you're the key to it all. You are eternal life. You offer everlasting love. So we praise you for coming to us. We praise you for revealing the love of the Father to us. God, we ask that you would help us to grow in our experience of this life and love. We pray, God, I pray that over these weeks especially, you would bring many people to know that they have eternal life. And you would bring many people to enjoy and experience in greater ways than ever before your everlasting love. May it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.